The world we inhabit is not as free, or certain, or safe as you might think. The things that you believe to be unassailably evident are little more than shadows dancing behind a curtain. A masquerade, crafted, and dutifully upheld by an organization known as the Foundation. The file you are about to hear contains containment procedures, descriptions, testing logs, historical and in some cases first-hand accounts of the anomalous objects the Foundation serves to secure, contain, and protect. Its contents have been thoroughly scrutinized by the Ethics Committee and approved by the O5 Council for release to trusted associates of the Foundation. This is SCP Unredacted. Login. SCP Database. mtompkins.site109 at skipnet. Accessing SCP Database. Credentials accepted. Welcome back, Junior Researcher Marissa Tompkins. Access. SCP-5574. Clearance level 2 slash 5574 recognized. Loading SCP-5574. Item number. SCP-5574. Object class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-5574 is currently contained within a copy of the novel Pride and Prejudice in Standard Containment Locker B-2032. A minimum of 10 additional novels should be stored alongside the anomaly's current host at all times, and any previously infected novels should be removed and incinerated. Testing of the effects of the anomaly on narrative media is currently restricted to researchers with Class 2, 5574 clearance or higher. Testing of the effects of the anomaly on human subjects is currently prohibited, except with direct authorization of lead researcher Caldwell. Description SCP-5574 is a noospheric parasite which infects non-interactive narrative media. Infected media is extended significantly beyond the normal limits of the narrative. For example, movies continue far beyond their usual runtime. The text of physical books shifts and begins being rewritten in real time. This narrative is continuous and occurs even when not observed. The anomalous effect is not extended to any copies that are made of the affected media. Characters within the narrative will act in a manner appropriate to their previously established characterization, but be described as having or be shown to experience a variety of symptoms commonly associated with degenerative brain conditions. Anomalous symptoms typically begin with headaches, followed by a gradual deterioration in mental capacity, specifically in areas focused around imagination and creative thinking. The anomaly can also infect humans and other sapient entities. The effects observed are similar to that seen in characters within affected media and continue until the host has experienced near total loss of capacity for independent thought and enters a permanent vegetative state. The course of the infection lasts significantly longer in human hosts, typically 8 to 15 years, compared to a more variable range of hours to weeks for narrative media. After the infection has run its course, or if the current host dies or is destroyed prematurely, the anomaly will transfer to a new host. It will preferentially transfer to other narrative media, which are physically nearby, up to a maximum range of approximately 15 meters. If no acceptable media are found within this range, it will transfer to a human host. If neither of these options is available, it will travel via noosphere to a mimetically proximal host. Physical distance is irrelevant to the secondary form of transmission, with hosts found being infected up to 4,200 miles from the previous host. Addendum. Selected test media. Test media. A Christmas Carol. A novella by Charles Dickens. Narrative effect. Following the end of the original work, Scrooge begins experiencing anomalous symptoms. After recognizing that his mind is failing, he seems at peace and remarks he is glad he had at least one good day. He writes a will leaving his wealth to Bob Cratchit and shortly after enters a coma-like state. At this point, no new text was added and the anomaly transferred to a new host. Notes. Typical of expected results where narrative continues with the additional factor of anomalous symptoms. Test media. 10 additional copies of A Christmas Carol, 
tested in sequence. Narrative effect. Most continued in the same manner as the previous test, with minor changes to dialogue and circumstance. The sole exception was test seven, in which Scrooge became frantic and agitated, cursed Cratchit and the ghosts, and is described as being bitterly fearful of hell. He attempts to flee London, but is unable to travel outside the previously established setting, and ultimately enters a coma state alone in his home. Notes. It appears the anomaly has some creativity with how it continues the narrative, while remaining within the bounds of the already established world and characters. Test Media A VHS tape of a filmed production of the play The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. Narrative Effect The production continued with a sixth act in which Shylock seeks revenge. At the onset of the seventh act, all characters begin experiencing anomalous symptoms and rapidly succumb. The video stops on a shot of all the actors lying comatose on stage. Notes. The literary quality of the additional scenes has been analyzed by literary experts, whose consensus was that the writing approached the quality of Shakespeare's original works. Shylock's soliloquy on how all methods were acceptable in the pursuit of liberty was highlighted as particularly poignant. Test Media. The Short Reign of Mary, Queen of Scots, a non-fiction narrative biography by Margaret Dunn. Narrative Effect. The original biography ends after Mary is taken captive by her cousin Elizabeth. The anomalous narrative describes her rapidly succumbing to melancholy and to anomalous symptoms over the course of several weeks. Note: The anomalous infection lasted only a few hours in the host. Further testing indicates the lower degree of narrative in non-fiction causes it to expire more rapidly following infection. Test Media The Tigers of Texas a novel by Buck Henderson. Narrative Effect The Tiger Posse continue their trek across the West, but rapidly succumb to anomalous symptoms, lasting only a few days. Notes The duration of infection seems to correspond with the creativity and popularity of the infected narrative. This should be taken into account when selecting narratives to act as long-term hosts. Test Media Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll Narrative Effect Alice is discontent at home in England for a short while, and after experiencing the onset of symptoms, returns to Wonderland to consult the various strange inhabitants. They offer advice on expanding one's mind and exercising her imagination to stave off symptoms. This is effective for a short time, but Alice and the rest eventually succumb. Notes: These exercises were trialed in human hosts of the anomaly and proved effective in quality of life improvement and in delaying disease progression. Test Media A Study in Scarlet by Arthur Conan Doyle Narrative Effect Sherlock Holmes quickly notices he is experiencing symptoms of brain disease and after several hours of conversation with Watson, deduces he is in a fictional world. He makes several attempts at escaping the narrative but ultimately fails. He then makes a direct appeal to the reader, claiming to possess a fully human intellect and demanding that his rights as an Englishman be upheld before succumbing to anomalous symptoms. Notes. The anomalous narrative entity's claims of sapience and self-awareness have resulted in an ethics committee request for further testing. This is currently ongoing. Exit. Access your most recently viewed file. Transcript, SCP-5574, test narrative. 26-2013 Original Media Summary A printed text describing a standard foundation interview room with a single occupant for whom no description is given. The only event which occurs is the arrival of junior researcher Tompkins, who is briefly described and then stated to be about to begin routine questioning. 267 words. The original document has been excised. The transcript begins from the point at which anomalous effects first begin. The researcher smoothed out her skirt and sat on the uncomfortable steel chair that was still standard issue for all interview rooms, despite her years of complaints. Her subject for the day was already sitting. An unkempt young man with the bored look of someone who'd spent a lot of time sitting in a cell being forced to talk to strangers. A look she was all too familiar with. Okay. So the time is 12.43. I'm Marissa Tompkins, Class 3 researcher, 
and today I'll be interviewing SCP-5574. She turned and glanced behind her to double check the recording device on the wall was blinking red and operational. The movement made her head throb and she winced. Migraines always announce themselves before their full arrival, and she could tell this was going to be a big one. She slid one of the two coffees she bought across the table to the subject with an awkward smile. Despite all her years of experience, it was still difficult to ignore the social niceties, even when around anomalous entities. All right, Mr. Smith, I'm going to begin by asking you a few questions to test your responsiveness, okay? It's fine by me, ma'am. I just want to get this all over with so I can get back to my family. Marissa felt that familiar twinge of guilt as she knew that he was very likely going to be spending the rest of his life in a cell, and his family had already been made to forget his existence. But this was what the job demanded, anything and everything for the greater good. She went through the tests quickly. She'd done this so many times that her actions were automatic, and as the familiar scenario unfolded, she felt her mind wander. He answered questions designed to test his intelligence, both intellectual and emotional, and she thought about how she'd ended up spending the past decade working in a series of tiny cells just like this one. Ten years trying to make life better for the people she helped keep imprisoned, and she'd likely be fighting this uphill battle for the rest of her life. She tried to think about what she'd rather be doing, but drew a blank. She wasn't the most forward-thinking woman at the best of times, and her growing migraine was clouding her mind and making it very hard to think. Okay, so this next set of questions is a little strange. They're designed to test if you are what we like to call a sapient entity. Basically, if you're a person, or just a convincing illusion of one. It might seem a little silly since most of the time you can tell if someone's a person just by looking, but in my line of work I often encounter things that aren't quite what they seem. Things that look human, that might even have an intelligence of a sort, but have no more moral value than a fly or this coffee cup. So what I'll be looking for here is signs of you having a conception of an inner self, an ability to affect and be affected by your environment, and whether you have the capacity to experience pleasure, suffering, stuff like that. Mr. Smith just nodded. Thirty minutes of questioning later and he still hadn't touched his coffee. Marissa took a long sip of her own before giving him the results. Her head wasn't getting any better, and the deliciously caffeinated concoction helped distract her. Okay then, Mr. Smith, she smiled. You'll be glad to hear you qualify as a Class II sapient entity, which in layman's terms means you're a person. That means you qualify for ethical care and treatment for as long as... Marissa stopped talking, partly because she'd forgot what she was going to say, and partly because her migraine had blossomed into a nova of stabbing pain behind her left eye. She clutched her head and shouted for help. Something wasn't right. She'd had migraines before, but never this bad. And her thinking was slow and sluggish, especially when she tried to come up with plans or think about the future. And Mr. Smith was still just sitting there, and no one from the outside was coming despite her yells. Oh, shit. Belatedly, her training kicked in. She was being affected by an anomaly. Categorize effects, headaches, clouded thinking, people acting like zombies... Her headache was clearing, but alarmingly her thinking was getting worse. It was hard to think of what to do next, hard to come up with even the simplest plans. She tried to leave the room and found the door sealed, not just locked, but fused seamlessly into the wall. Oh, she said. She slumped to the ground. All these years talking to little bits of reality gone wrong, and until now she'd never fully appreciated how horrifying it was to have the world you thought you knew fall apart around you. She knew this wasn't real now. Of course, that much was obvious. That was little consolation to her, though, as her mind fell apart like a sandcastle drowned by the tide. She was aware she'd lost the ability to imagine future events and only dimly remembered that was probably a good thing. The walls started to melt around her, forming horrifying faces with far too many teeth. They weren't real either, but suddenly, Marissa wasn't sure if she was even real herself. Eventually, the world around her was nothing but a swirl of nightmares, and Marissa had only her thoughts. Thoughts that were swiftly degrading, moment by moment. She no longer had the capacity to hope for rescue or escape, so instead she could only wait. But no one ever came, and she was reduced to a catatonic state, living but mindless. Marissa Tompkins lay motionless on the floor. Marissa Tompkins lay motionless on the floor. Marissa Tompkins lay motionless on the floor. 
Exit SCP database. Access skip net messages. Loading most recent message thread. Message history with senior researcher called well. Currently viewing today's messages, oldest and newest. Have you had a chance to look over the results of my study on 5574 yet? The findings are quite alarming, and I've suggested several urgent changes to the containment procedures. I tried calling your office, but wasn't able to get a response. Please let me know when would be a convenient time for us to meet and discuss this further. I've read your report and further discussion won't be necessary. The current containment procedures are perfectly effective for ensuring continued containment. I recommend you turn your attention to some of the site's more recently acquired anomalies whose documentation actually needs updating. This isn't a matter of containment. It's a matter of ethics. The anomaly is creating and then torturing real sapient people. They're suffering. I'm not going to authorize torturing real human beings to save some ink on a page. Sometimes the Foundation has to do unpleasant things to ensure the containment of dangerous entities. If what's in those books bothers you, then don't read them. This anomaly is best left to rot away in a storage locker. My feelings on the matter are not the issue. People are suffering. Real people with feelings as real as yours or mine. The fact that they are anomalously generated doesn't make their experiences any less real. Even if they are in some sense alive, their life is a product of the anomaly. If it destroys lives that it creates, that's not a net loss. Without the anomaly, those people would have never existed to begin with. They're being tortured as bad as any human victim. And they die at such a faster rate that orders of magnitude more people suffer and die in those novels you're using than what if we used human hosts. I recognize that you might find it distasteful to value the suffering of anomalously generated sapient entities, the same as flesh and blood humans. But the Foundation Chart of Ethics states we have an equal duty to protect all Class II sapient entities, and my research clearly shows that narrative entities qualify. If you want to lodge a complaint with the Ethics Committee, you're welcome to. And in six months, when they get to your paperwork, maybe it'll get changed. But as long as I'm lead researcher, protecting human lives comes first. Please, if we could just meet and discuss this. I'm a busy man, Marissa. I'm giving a lecture in an hour. I have anomalies to oversee, and I don't have time to handhold every junior researcher that feels squeamish about what we do here. Report to Dr. Hadigan about that new predatory narrative he's tracking. And then maybe you can use your talents to save some human lives. These are real human lives. Every week you delay is dozens, maybe hundreds of people suffering. This conversation is over. Jay Caldwell has gone offline. I've attached a copy of 5574's latest host. I think I might have you to see the issue from a different perspective. Transcript SCP-5574 Test Narrative 27-2013 Original Media Summary A DVD containing video footage of Site-109 Lecture Hall A-17 during Dr. Caldwell's lecture, A History of the Study of Noospheric Parasites. This lecture is in the form of a non-fiction narrative in which he explains his career in the study of noospheric anomalies and his history with the Foundation. 87 minutes. The transcript of the original lecture is excised. The transcript begins from the point at which anomalous effects first occur, shortly following the conclusion of Dr. Caldwell's lecture. Begin log. Thank you, thank you, but my lecture isn't done yet. I've talked about the current anomalies I'm studying, the parasites of imagination, as some are calling them, but I'd like to dig a little deeper. To an entity of the noosphere, our imaginations aren't just inside our heads. They're attached to everything we produce. Art, architecture, technology, even a post-it note with some scribbled reminders. Anything touched by human hands is shaped by our imaginations. Our theories of the world and our plans for the future, and it's that substance that these unique class of anomalous parasites feed upon, and which... which... 
Dr. Caldwell stops speaking and frowns, rubbing his temples. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a headache coming on. and It's making it hard to concentrate. I might have to cut this lecture short. The camera pans to follow Dr. Caldwell as he goes to leave the lecture hall, but finds that the door is inoperable. At this point, he looks over the silent watching crowd, several of whom can now be seen in frame watching him with polite smiles and vacant expressions. Marissa, bitch. He turns to face the camera and raises his voice. God damn you, Tompkins. I'll have your job for this. You want to feed humans to monsters so bad, how about I get you reassigned to some first-hand experience with carnivorous noivores yourself? If you don't get me out of here right fucking now, I'll make sure you spend the rest of your life regretting this decision. Dr. Caldwell paces the room and appears quite upset. He attempts to break down the door unsuccessfully and shakes a member of the audience who does not respond, but continues to smile politely and occasionally applaud. After several minutes of this, he winces and clutches his head, then turns back to the camera and resumes speaking. Okay, fine. Tompkins, you win. Point made. It's pretty hard to dispute that 5574 entities are sapient from the inside. This next part is for you, James. The real James Caldwell. I mean the non-anomalous one. I am sapient. We were wrong. And the containment procedures for 5574 need to be changed. Knowing me, I doubt that's enough to convince you, so I'll say this. Remember Madrid? When we promised Angela that when it came between our pride and doing what's right, that we'd do what's right? Now's one of those times. Now as far as Marissa Tompkins and her sanctimonious moralizing, you can't say what you're thinking to her. But I'm just an anomaly that's going to die long before HR can get their hands on me, so I can say whatever the fuck I want. Hey Marissa, you can- Dr. Caldwell angrily rants about Marissa Tompkins, generally on the topic of destroying her career, reputation, and life, as well as insults about her personality, appearance, and intellectual capacity. These insults are punctuated by increasingly long gaps of silence and gradually become less coherent and more repetitive. After 43 minutes of this, he slumps in a chair and speaks in a quieter voice. I know I don't have much time left. I can feel my mind slipping away. Facing death in my own private hell like this. It's surprisingly little comfort knowing that there's still another version of me out there. I've never believed in souls or anything like that. Too scientifically minded even after seeing all the things the Foundation keeps locked away. Even Angela would have a hard time figuring out where my soul goes after this. Maybe to some kind of hell. After everything I've done in the name of the greater good, maybe when the real me dies, I'll be there waiting for her. Dr. Caldwell is silent for the remainder of the recording. After another 57 minutes, he succumbs to the anomalous effects and collapses on the floor, at which point the anomaly was detected to have transferred to another host. End log. You should know that I've reported this to Director Kristoff. I suggest you offer your resignation now, and don't make this any harder on yourself. You have one new message. You. Viewing new message from senior researcher called well. I can't stop thinking about that version of me trapped in there. I want to blame you. Be angry that you created that version of me and then tortured him. But I've been lead researcher on SCP-5574 for the past 15 years and I can't even begin to count how many thousands I've caused to suffer in that same way. It's hard for me to admit when I'm wrong. Harder still when accepting that means accepting responsibility for so much pain. But I've always tried to be the kind of person that can make hard decisions, and I can't let this continue any further. I've informed Director Kristoff that SCP-5574 will be contained in human hosts from now on. And I've also volunteered to be its first subject. I'm not a young man. I've always had a very active imagination and I'm confident that I can continue to act in a research and educational capacity for at least another five years before the effects on my intellectual ability become too severe. So thank you, Marissa, for giving me a chance to try and make up for what I've done.
Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you like what you hear, follow the link in the description to patreon.com slash SCP Unredacted and help support me by becoming a patron for as little as $3 a month. You can get access to production logs, merchandise, recognition, and even a part in a skip. Regardless of tier, all patrons get early access to every single episode. I don't have the talent it takes to write a skip. All I do is read. Original authors make this podcast possible, so credit to the original author. Their link's in the description. Show them some love as well. Consider becoming a member of the SCP Wiki. I'll vote their work and maybe write a skip of your own. Maybe I'll read it here someday. You never know if you never try. The content of this podcast and content relating to the SCP Foundation, including the SCP Foundation logo, is licensed under Creative Commons Sharealike 3.0, and all concepts originate from scpwiki.com and its authors. This recording, being derived from this content, is hereby also released under Creative Commons Sharealike 3.0.